Well, this morning we're going to uh, do, uh, do our worship service just a little bit differently, and actually I'm going to give the message in two different parts, and so this is the first part of, uh, of the message for this morning, and we have been uh, looking at what it takes to be a follower of Jesus, and since the first of January we've had this cross here, and we have been putting words on it that signify what it means to, to follow Jesus with everything that we have in our life, and um, this morning we're going to look at the word filled. And we're going to see how and what we have to be filled with and about uh, to engage this fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ in, in each one of our lives. And we're going to look at a couple parts of Scripture and, and what that means to follow Jesus Christ in our life. And, and um, the, the first part we're going to look at comes from the Old Testament. And if you want to get out your Bibles, you can do that. Isaiah chapter 12 is where we're going to go. And this is a story of, of the nation of Israel. And they had been through a lot. Sometimes they had good leaders and sometimes they had bad leaders. Sometimes they followed God and embraced His call. Sometimes they turned away from God. Sometimes they wanted to do what God wanted them to do, and other times they rebelled. But in all of this, for whatever was the purpose of God, and we know what that purpose was from history, but at the time, somehow God had kept his hand on them. And because of this, they were given an instruction from God to do something so that they could continue to be filled with the presence of God. And not only was this message for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, but this message of this filling of Jesus and this filling of God's Spirit and this filling of God the Father is for us today as well. And in Isaiah 12, beginning in, in verse 1, it says this, You will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. Part of being filled with the very presence of God, part of being a Christ follower is to be filled with thanks for God and what he does. It says this, For though you are angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Now the Lord was angry with them because they, they could have been angry with them because of their sin, because they had done things, again, as a nation that was against the will and the purpose of God. They had done things. God had told them, don't do this, and they did it anyway. Honor me, and they chose not to. They had done so many things that were against God, but yet God would forgive them, and God would embrace them, and God would call them his people. Now, I want to ask you a question this morning, and it's a really obvious answer, and I don't ask it to, to be trivial or anything like that, but I ask it so that we can embrace this reality of what God has done for us. How many of us have sinned and done something that we know is against the plan of God for our life? Okay? Every single one of us. So this verse that was written to the nation of Israel fits us as well. God, even though I have done these things and even though God was angry with me for violating his purpose for his life, for, for my life, for violating his word, for doing things that I knew were wrong, but I did them anyway, I deserve God's anger. I deserved his punishment. I deserved his condemnation. But although I deserved all that, his anger turned away from me. And his might, his strength, his love, it embraced me with forgiveness. And for that, I had to be filled with a sense of thankfulness for this God, this Christ that I follow. And then it goes on in verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. God is the one who forgives me when I don't follow him, who forgives me when I don't practice justice and mercy, who forgives me when my heart, well, it's a little bit mine and some his, I mean, God wants it all to be given to him. And when I don't do that, when, when I don't worship this worthy God, when I don't seek him, when I don't give as I should, when I don't surrender as I should, God forgives me. And for that, I'm thankful. And then it goes on in verse 2. I will trust you and not be afraid. You know, there's so many things in life that can cause us to be afraid, that can cause us to be uneasy. I mean, everything from key decisions that we have to make for the direction of our life, for, for, for key decisions for jobs and our security, for our families, for our health, for all kinds of things. There's so many things that can, can steal our contentment, can steal this, this sense of all is at right with the world and with God and my relationship. We can allow so many things to come in and steal our happiness and our contentment. But we say, you know what, when we trust in God, when we give him that trust, we don't have to be afraid. Because the very presence of God, the very Son of God lives in us and lives in our heart. For the Lord God is my strength 
and he is my song. He has become my salvation. And then the, the, the next verse says, with, draw, with joy you will draw water from the well of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, and proclaim that his name is exalted. You see, this passage of scripture points to the fact that we need to praise God for who he is and what he has done. God has offered us forgiveness. God has offered us um, uh, contentment. God has offered us a sense of trust and a sense of security, even when the world around us may be blowing apart. God has offered us so much spiritually, and we as his people not only need to be filled with the very presence of God so our lives can be lived differently, but we need to be filled with people who are full of the praises to our awesome God who has accepted us and who has loved us. Now, on your pews, you have some three by five cards and hopefully you've got enough for everybody. I want you to grab one of those cards and if you don't have enough in your pew, if more of you have crammed in a pew than you have cards, just find a pew where there's some empty cards and grab a card. Everybody needs a card. And then everyone needs something to write with. If you don't have a writing utensil, just stick your hand up and the ushers will come by and, and make sure that you've got a pencil. So there's a, there's a whole bunch down here in front. Um, our little pew racks where the, where the pencils go, people have broken off pencils in there and we can't get them in anymore, so we're just going to pass out the pencils. So. And, and as they're passing those out, I'm going to give you the instructions of what I want you to do on, uh, on one side of the card. On one side of your card, we have just read, there's some more here in the center, guys, right down front. Um, we have just read about the faithfulness and the goodness of God spiritually. And on the side of the card, whatever side of the card you have up, I want you to thank God. Now, you're not going to turn these in, okay? I want to make that clear. You're not going to give them to anybody else. This is for you to write down, I want you to thank God for things that God has done in your life spiritually. Forgiveness. You may want to thank God for his presence. You may want to thank God for his loving you. You want to th maybe thank God for his guidance. You want to thank God for something spiritually that he has given you in your heart and in your life and give him praise because as Christ followers, we're filled with that kind of praise for our awesome God. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes and I'd like you to, to write those things on your, on your card as Mike plays, okay? As you finish up, and feel free to continue writing, I'm going to go on and read Isaiah chapter 12, verses 5 and 6. And it says this, Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known to all in the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. You know, in the, in the time that this scripture was written, the nation of Israel was one of the most blessed nations on the face of the earth. When they were in their deepest need, God would provide manna from heaven. When they were needing water, God would provide that. When they were needing food, God would provide that. When they were needing direction, God would provide their direction. God also provided them with the promised land. He, he promised that he would stake out a place for them to exist. And God gave them that material thing of that land. God gave them a land where where they was abundant in food and was abundant in wealth. And God gave them those kind of things. And, and Isaiah was warning the nation, don't forget that you are blessed with your material things and you should be filled with thanks for this God who has given you so much. You know, a few months ago, it was all over the news, the protests of the 1% and the 99%, how you know, people were protesting against the wealthiest 1% in our society. And every time I would see that on the news, I'd want to crawl inside of my TV and 
holy and religiously strangle somebody because <laughs> if there is holy and religious strangling. But anyway, I'd want to crawl in and say, wait a minute, just being in America, you are some of the most blessed people on the face of the earth. Even if you're unemployed and just by living here, we are so blessed. And as people, we not only need to thank God for the spiritual things he's given us, but we need to thank God and we need to be filled with praise for our homes and our cars and our place to worship and our place to get in out of the cold and have warmth and shelter and all of those things. We need to thank God for when we get stuck in traffic because many places in the world, people can't even afford to have a car to get stuck in traffic with. And so on the flip side of that card, I want you to turn it over. On the back of that card, I want you to just write the material things that you have that you just want to be filled. God, thank you for my car. Thank you for my house. Thank you for that I have food on the table. Thank you, God, for all of this stuff that I don't take time to thank you for. But boy, I've got to thank you. I've got to be filled with this thanks. Let's take a few minutes and write those thanks out to God. Uh, apparently, we have computer failure, Chris. <laughs> I, just told, I, just, I just told Todd I'm going to hear about this tomorrow. That's right. Chris and I have this ongoing deal of uh, Windows machines versus Apple machines, and so tomorrow, I can't wait to get in the office. Can you, Chris? <laughs> I need a vacation day. You need a vacation day? You're going to need a vacation day. That's right. Anyways, maybe we'll show you that one next week, all right? Okay. Um, hey, g um, get out your Bibles and turn to John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, okay? John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. And um, we, we looked at being thankful, and earlier you wrote on those little cards in your, in your seats, you wrote, you know, what you were thankful for that God had given you in, uh, in your spirit and in your spiritual life, and what material things that you have been thankful for. And that's part of being this Christ follower and being filled with the presence of God is to be filled with the presence of God so that we're thankful. And that's, quite frankly, that feels good and that's great to be thankful for God and we should be thankful. Sometimes we forget to be thankful and quite frankly, there isn't any place in the body of Christ for grumpy Christians because we should be filled with praise and thanks for what God does in our hearts and our lives but you know what? That's only part of the filling that God wants to bring into our life. He wants us to fill, be filled with him so that we can do something with our life and so that we can serve him. And so now we go to the New Testament and, and we discover another part of this filling of God. And it, it, it's a familiar passage that's really deep in meaning. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Now, this was written in a, into an audience that were very steeped and, and very knowledgeable about the agricultural community. And, and maybe we're not as, as knowledgeable about, about that community as this was given. So kind of let me walk you through this process. When we lived in our, our home before we moved to come here, um, I, had a, I had a vineyard in my backyard. Now, before you get, like, delusions of grandeur, my vineyard was six feet long. Okay? I had two 4x4 four four posts, and I had four cables running on the 4x4 four four posts, and I had four vines planted. Two were grapes that were purple, and two were grapes that were green. Okay? So that was my vineyard. All right? so, and I learned a lot about that. Now, I don't have all of the technical names, so I just say, you know, the things that were planted in the ground and the things that come up that go on. So that's my technical knowledge of vineyards. But what I do know from those vineyards is that if I was going to get grapes off of those, and the grapes were really, really good, and they were, they were different because they were fresh, and we'd go out, and on a good year, on my six-foot vineyard, we'd get a bucket or maybe a little bit more uh, of grapes off that, and we would eat them fresh. I mean, there's nothing better than these vine-ripe grapes that were, were grown right on your, your own vineyard, okay? Now, over the summer, this, these these cables that I had strung between these two four by four posts that were in the ground, I mean, they would just get covered and they would be thick of these green branches and they'd go off into the yard and they'd go everywhere. They'd just grow with abandon as they grew. And then we'd have to uncover these huge leaves and find these, these, uh, the, these things of grapes that were just there, these clusters of, of these grapes that were hanging. Now, every February, when it was really cold, I'd have to go out to those grapevines 
And I would take my pruning shears to those and I'd just mutilate them. I mean, I'd take 85, 90% of all of the vines that were on that and I'd, I'd whack them all off. So all we had was literally the four stalks that were coming up and maybe one branch that was going on each one of the, uh, the wires on my vineyard, okay? And, and that's all I'd have and everything else would be gone. I'd, I'd cut it up, put it in a bag or I'd burn it or take it out to the trash and I, I'd just get rid of it because I had to cut it down so that the next year they would produce. If I didn't do that and I just left all those stranglings, the, the, the plant would put all of its energy into reaching out to all of these different branches that were around and it would produce big leaves but it wouldn't produce any fruit. So literally, it had to be cut and it had to be pruned in order for fruit to be produced. And just because it had produced fruit in the past didn't mean it would produce fruit in the future unless it was trimmed. And so the people that John was talking to, they understood this. They, they knew it. They lived it. But we don't know it and we don't live it like the people did that, that, that live in an agricultural society. So that's the setting. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Well, that's pretty strong language. Every part of me, you know, I'm so filled with this Jesus, I'm so filled as a Christ follower, that there are parts of me that Jesus is going to come in and prune out and take away and get out, out of me. And every branch that, that does bear fruit, he's going to leave alone, right? No, that's not what it says. It says every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. For what reason? so it'll bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So he's, he's telling his listeners, you're clean on the inside. You're, you're filled with this Jesus on the inside and you're part of this vine. You've been grafted in to this family of Christ. Jesus is, is the vine and, and you are the branches, but the Father is going to come and he's going to prune us. He's going to change us. He's going to make us. And then it says in verse 4, abide in me and I in you. Now, this word abide means that I live in Christ. I mean, my life is centered around Christ. I mean, many times we can get our life centered around other things, and many times we can get our focus off, and we have to come back to Christ and ask for forgiveness and get re-centered to our, our center equilibrium, our center focus. But he says we need to be active. This filling thing isn't a one-time deal that happens in our life, and the Christ Spirit comes and fills us one time, but it's an ongoing activity that every day we say, God, fill me, and God the Father, you have permission to trim me and prune me and change me so that I can bear fruit. In other words, you can't have a great experience spiritually one time in your life and say, I'm set. It's an ongoing daily experience and relationship with Jesus Christ. And then he continues, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Now you may have all kinds of talents and all kinds of abilities and you may be next to superhuman incredible. Okay? But you can't bear fruit for Jesus on your own. You've got to have this filling. You've got to have this abiding of God the Father in you, pruning you and making you what he wants you to be. Because he continues, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then Jesus clearly says, so, so we understand. This is what I, I like about John. I like John's writing because he gives us an illustration and then he says, okay, this is what I mean. And you don't have to be a biblical scholar to understand this. You just have to read it. And John says that Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, whoever lives in me and I live in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, what does this word fruit mean? Well, this word fruit, the same word fruit is used in many different contexts. It, it's used in spiritual contexts. It's used in in numerical context, it's used in reaching out and winning people to Christ context. If you say, what does a fruit mean? Does it mean that I grow spiritually? The answer is yes. This fruit, does it mean that I grow in relationship to other Christians? The answer is yes. This fruit, does it mean that I go out and I, I tell others who don't know about Jesus about Jesus? The answer is yes. So any connotation that you can think about fruit, the answer is yes and more. And it all comes back to this filling. When God fills us, we're filled with this fruit. We're filled with this fruit that we encourage those that are in the body. We love those that are in the body. We pray for those that are in the body of Christ. 
we submit ourselves to Jesus. We are filled with the very presence of Jesus. The Father prunes us and he designs us so that we can go outside of the body and bear fruit in our community, in our world, and we are used to tell people about Jesus. Yes, none of those are excluded from the Christian life, but all of those things are expected of the Christian. Jesus is the vine, and we, we are the branches. Let me explain this kind of from a personal story. Now, you've heard some of this story before. I, 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 I've told you that, um, that I went to school. I didn't want to be a pastor, and part of the reason I didn't want to be a pastor was my grandfather was a pastor, and my dad was a pastor, and I didn't want to have anybody say, well, you're a pastor because your grandfather and dad was a pastor. So I was determined not to be a pastor so I could break the cycle so people couldn't say that about me, okay? It was a very spiritual decision that I had made, all right? And uh, so I went to University of Michigan, and, you know, I had the job. I committed to the job, and God called me, and I quit the job, and I, I went to seminary, and I got into seminary. Now, this is a part of the story that I haven't told you. I got into seminary, and I quickly learned that I was a fish out of water at seminary. I mean, I just simply didn't fit at seminary. Now, and here's why I didn't fit at seminary. At that time, the other guys, and I'm, I'm not being sexist here, but I'm really old, and when I went to seminary, there's like three women and 997 men, okay? And so that's how it was. Not, not a day. It's not that way at all, and that's good, and, and that's the way it should be, but back in, you know, my day, okay, that's how it was, all right? And, and so I went to seminary, and and people would talk about, where did you go to school? And people would say, oh, I went to Spring Arbor College, which is a free Methodist college, or I went to Asbury College, which is a United Methodist college, or I went here, or I went there. They all went to Christian colleges. They all had, you know, I studied youth ministry, or I studied pastoral ministry. And, they all, and then they'd turn to me and say, where did you go to school? And I'd say, well, I went to University of Michigan. And then they'd kind of pause, and they'd say, oh. Like, you know, I was a second-class Christian, because I didn't go to a Christian school. I went to a secular university, so somehow I didn't measure up or something like that, you know. And uh, then they say, well, what did you study? Thinking that I'd say ancient literature or, you know, because you can study biblical things even at a secular institution. And I said, administration. And then they just said, oh, okay. And so I was the, oh, okay, so you're here. So then I got in my classes, and in my classes, I don't know, I was just different. Um, it ex probably explains a lot of things. Now you're saying, okay, now we understand it. Now we know why it's a little different, okay? And, and so I was just a little different because at that time it was before computers and we filed all of our papers in milk crates, okay? And we'd carry milk crates back and forth to classes with us. And one of the things that we had to create in our milk crate, okay, was liturgy. Now liturgy is forms of worship, okay? We do some liturgy when we take communion. I have certain things that I read you say the Lord's Prayer, then I say some things, and we go back and forth. Liturgy is like a, a formal style of worship. And these guys were all into their milk crate with their liturgy. And I'm in class saying, why do we have to do this? Because liturgy isn't going to reach anybody for Jesus. And they're saying, well, it's a function. It's a form of the church. And I'm saying, it may be the function, the form of the church, but the guy down the street doesn't care about liturgy. He needs to care about our Jesus. So then they would discard me as this weird person and and we'd have all these discussions in class. And so finally it came part in my seminary where I had to do a required internship. And they would take us and they would break us off into groups of about 10 people and we'd be assigned to a local church. And in that local church we'd have to give the announcements, have the, the prayer time, we'd have to go to the kids groups and the youth groups and the adult groups and we'd have to go to board meetings and we'd have to learn how a church functioned. And I got assigned to be with Dr. Art Brown who Later, I went to work for at Free Methodist World Missions, and I got assigned to his church, and I went to his church, and I was a pastoral intern there, and I was doing my internship, and as part of my internship, we had to take an assessment of our calling. And so I took my assessment for my calling, and everybody else in my group, the other 10 people, all had appointments with Dr. Brown in his office to go over their assessment. Well, Dr. Brown called me and said, hey, could I come out to your house to talk to you about your assessment? Now, that should have been my first clue that the assessment did not go well, okay? He wanted to get me out of the church. He wanted to get me away from everybody else so he could sit down and talk with me. And, and I know many of you don't know Dr. Brown, but he is the most positive person in the world. He always has a smile on his face. He sees nothing negative on anything. So he came in, and he started telling me 
what a beautiful creation I was in Christ and how God wanted to use me. And right away I knew that it had not gone well on the assessment. Okay? And uh, so finally he got around to talking. He went through the assessment. And then he got to the point, he said, have you ever considered another career? Okay? That wasn't what somebody who had left a career to go into seminary, to go into the pastor, wanted to hear at all. And um, I was younger and... I still do this sometimes. I say things I shouldn't say without thinking. And I said, well, Dr. Brown, you just asked the wrong questions on the assessment. And he said, well, we have been giving this assessment for, you know, 15 years. And I said, well, you've been asking the wrong questions for 15 years. So then we got into a discussion, and the assessment was all about how to do church inside the church, and it didn't have anything to do with outside the church. So I answered everything by saying, but the church has to look at this, but the church has to look at this, but the church has to look at this. Not that we throw away what we do inside the church, but that we have a heart and a passion that we're always looking out. So we got into a long discussion about that, and he let me stay in seminary, and I went on and graduated, and, and I was accepted sort of in the fold, and, and I got through, and, and now I'm here today to say that God has taken me on a long journey, and he's pruned me, and he's changed me through the years. But that passion is still in me to get the church to understand that we have a responsibility to love Jesus and love one another and care for one another. But then we have this responsibility to be this, this vine that's been, been, been put right into the vine of Jesus. And we have this responsibility to grow out and outside of ourselves in order that we bear fruit. And, and I mean, that's just... I don't know, that's just how God has made me as a person. Maybe, actually, maybe I, I don't know if there's such thing as genetics that play a role in this. I don't know, my, my grandfather did some things that he probably was a little bit different for his time. And my dad, who, who some of the older people in the church know, he's been a pastor and our leader in our denomination for a long time. He actually pushed the envelope too. He tells me the story of in the 40s when you couldn't have any instruments in the church. And pianos were of the devil and everything, so you could have nothing. You had to sing a cappella, okay? And uh, he lived in a church where the parsonage was like this far away from the church. I mean, the church building, and then the parsonage was literally built right next to it. And all that there was in was just like a foot between the two buildings. He would open up the windows in the church on Sunday and then open up the windows in the, their parsonage in their home on Sundays. And my mother would go over and play the piano in her house and then the people in the church would hear the music, and that was okay because the piano wasn't in the church, it was in the house. So they could sing the music in the church while listening to the piano while it was over in the house, okay? And so, I mean, I don't know, maybe I get it from my dad. I'll blame him anyway, okay? But, but through that whole process, God has just given me a passion to look at this passage of Scripture a little differently and say, you know, if Jesus wants us to be fruit, yes, he wants us to be filled with him. Yes, he wants us to bear fruit in our spiritual lives. Yes, he wants us to abide in him. Yes, he wants us to commit it to each other. Yes, he wants us to love each other and support each other and care for each other. But if all we do is care for each other, then John 15 doesn't happen. We have to reach out and reach our vine outside of the vineyard and grow fruit where no fruit has been grown before. And God calls us to be that light into our world and that light into our local community. You know, I got in the pastorate 25 plus years ago. In my generation, and I hate talking this way because it means that I'm old, okay? I always thought of myself as a young guy, but I realize I'm not, okay? In my generation, we were part of the church because our parents were part of the church. I mean, I grew up loving the church, and I don't, I honestly, I don't have a very great testimony of, of straying away from God and I got into sin and God did this miraculous transformation and then I came back to the church. Mine's boring. I grew up in the church. I loved the church as an early age. I loved Jesus. At 12, I realized I needed to personally ask him to forgive my sins. I did that. I've always been in the church. I've always wanted to be in the church. I've never wanted to go away from the church and I've never wanted to do anything that God didn't want me to do. Pretty boring, okay? But in all of that... I've noticed something. I've noticed that today generations aren't like my generation was anymore. Stuff is changing. 
And it means that I have to be challenged in my life to be the vine that Jesus calls me to be in John chapter 15. Let me give you some statistics about my kids' generation, okay? This is just one generation removed from my generation who everybody I grew up with is still in church because their parents were in church and that's what you do. You stay connected with Jesus. But this is my kids' generation and now there's even, I'm getting older because there's even a generation below my kids because my kids' friends are having babies and now there's another generation under them. But, but this is what my kids' generation say about the church, okay? And, and we need to understand this, okay? Churches are overprotective and just interested in telling me what not to do. 6.3 people out of 10 say that. Now, I don't know how you get 6.3 people because you can't divide up people that way, but that's the average of the, the survey. And these are the latest, these are the latest results from the, from the Barna organization, okay? Christianity is shallow, not relevant, and the Bible is not taught, 78%. Actually, my kids' generation, they want to hear what the Bible says, but sometimes we're afraid to preach the Bible and say, hey, this is what God's Word says. It's not that we say we're right and you're wrong. It says, hey, this is God's Word. God's Word says that we practice justice and mercy and we do faith and deeds and we sacrifice our heart and we worship a worthy God and we expect God to work and we seek Him and we give our resources and we surrender and we're active. That's what God's Word says. And we know that the younger generations, they want to know what God's Word says, but they don't want us to be shallow about our faith. In other words, I think sometimes they see a disconnect. They see us preaching and saying, this is what God's Word says, but they don't see my generation doing what God's Word says. Okay? Let's go on to the next one. Um, they actually say God seems missing from the church. 20% of them say they go to church and they don't see God, okay? Sixty percent of this age group um, that grew up in the church um, no longer um, are in the church later. Uh, oh, I skipped a couple, didn't I, Gail? Sorry. My sexual mistakes are judged, 67 percent. This group has a lot of things in their life that they have done sexually. And my generation and generations before me did too. We just didn't talk about it. Now they talk about them. And they come into the church with those scars. And instead of loving them and embracing them and helping them, too often the church judges them. And so they walk away. Okay, the next one. Um, church is unfriendly to doubters. 87%. Somebody comes in, that's why I wanted to see the video that didn't work. Somebody comes in and they look differently or they act differently. And my generation tends to immediately judge them. Where Jesus said... Love them as I have loved you, okay? 60% um, of this age group that grew up in the church are no longer in the churches of 2012. Six out of 10 of the generation of my kids who have graduated from high school and are now in college, six out of 10 are no longer in the church today, okay? 43% of that group never attend church even when grandma gives them a guilt trip on Easter, they won't come to church, okay? And regular participants in the local church are decreasing at an increasing rate every year. So in 2011, it was less than 60%. And then 2012, it was 60%. 2013, their predictions are it could approach 80%. So there's a disconnect. And if we look at that, man, we could get really depressed. But that's not what I want to look at. I want to look at something else that, that is, talks to us, that talks directly to John 15, that talks about this, I am the vine and I want to use you to bear fruit. I want to prune you. I want to change you. I want to mold you. As you abide in me, I want to, I want to create in you an ability to reach out. Look at this. This is really cool, okay? 60% of all ages, Okay? 18 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80. I mean, yeah, if you look at the statistics, it may be 58.1% and 62.3%, but, but right on that 60% who have left the church will return not only to the church, but they'll return to Jesus, and that's more important than the church. But they'll return to Jesus if they engage in a meaningful relationship with a family member or friend who loves Jesus. You know what that means? 
six out of ten will come back to Jesus. If you and I abide in Christ and we say, Jesus, it's not me, it's not my ability, God, you work through me and help me establish a relationship with someone who's walked away from you and Jesus you abide in me and as I abide in you and you abide in me God it's you that works and it's you that create the fruit to me that's incredibly exciting that's incredibly hopeful not all is lost in the church I think the local church is going to be the source of the revival that God has to bring to this world and to our nation it's got to come it's ironic that so many of this group leave the church and then they turn around and they plant a church. I mean, I quite haven't figured that out. Church is bad, so we'll create something that we think is bad and, and that whole deal. But it's because God's will and God's design is the church and we're the church. And so God's design is us to be the vine and the branches to bear fruit. Here's something else that, that I found fascinating is that 18 to 30-year-olds are actually looking for a relationship with an older generation with people who have shown a life of embracing Christ and they actually desire a multi-generational group of Christ followers that's incredibly exciting to me it's incredibly encouraging because that means even though I'm old and even though there's two generations coming up behind me and even though I've got a past that's so different I have hope that maybe through allowing Christ to abide in me and my faithfulness and my love for Jesus, maybe God can use that to reach somebody that's very much different than I am. And so that's encouraging to me and that's, that, that gives me hope and that gives me promise. I want to read you again John chapter 15 beginning in verse 3. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to be filled with you. We want to be filled with your praises for what you've done spiritually in our lives. God, we want to give you praise for your acceptance. We want to give you praise, God, that you've held your anger back. And instead of giving us your anger, you've given us your son Jesus who shed his blood for our forgiveness. God, we want to thank you for your love. We want to thank you for your protection. We want to thank you for your encouragement. God, we want to thank you for our things. God, that's all part of being filled with your presence. And Lord, we want you to abide in us as we abide in you. And we want to be filled with your mission. We want to be filled with the mission of loving and supporting and encouraging those that are in God's family called the church. We want to be about the task of lifting one another up inside of the walls of the church so that we're encouraged, so that we want to follow Jesus with our, with our friends and our family that's called our church family. But God, we know that you have also called us to do beyond just our walls. You have called us to bear fruit in our culture. And Lord, there are people who have walked away from you who you still are working in their life. They may not even realize it. And it's your plan and it's your design that you abide in us. And through that, you working in us, you, you've designed us to intersect with them and us to speak to them and us to draw them back to you, God. We're your plan. And so, God, enable us to be pruned. Enable us to be changed. Enable us to be made like your son Jesus so that we can be used by God the Father. Lord, help us in each season to bear much fruit for you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for worshiping this morning. Thanks for letting us switch it up today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.